so I had this idea the other day. I was driving or doing something I can't remember. And uh, I came up with this plan for these these like retro mugs. This one is Montana. It's got a bull elk and a bunch of like little cow elks. Elks? It's irrelevant. And what I wanted to do was basically start to give these mugs back per episode to listeners of the podcast that come up with the best comment in the comment section. Um, I, I want to do more as far as like directly relate to the audience, you know, talk to people that listen to the show, get their feedback. What do they want to see? But more importantly, just get people super fired up about coffee. Uh, you know, these things, I think coffee aficionados call them vessels, whatever lame fucking thing the coffee industry comes up with. What they are is they're really cool mugs from like the 80s, 90s. Sometimes I went all the way back into the 1950s and 60s. I found a bunch of these things. So, you know, like, share, leave a comment, uh, and we'll reach out and send you a mug. Thanks. Black Rifle Coffee, baby. Pretty cool. <laughs>
maybe not like I do anymore, but you know, um, he's just a man. So, um, when he came in though, I think, uh, it wasn't a feeling of starstruck, but it, it was a bit surreal, you know, having a uh, POTUS in my room. Right. Um, but it, it was the amount of time that he spent in the room with me and my family and just how personable he was. Um, there was absolutely zero politics, you know, um, aside from maybe one comment he said, he, like, he took a look at me and he was like, uh, I can tell you're one of mine, aren't you? Like, <laughs> so everybody kind of laughed, but, uh, um, he was very down to earth, um, and very, very warm. And I, it struck me, um, just how different he was in person than the rest of the world sees him. Mm. And I kind of wished that, uh, you know, more people could see that, um, because I think we are so divided and as a nation that, you know, there's, you know, half over half, I don't know how many, uh, of the people living in our country, they only see, um, they only see the person on camera and, and they don't realize that there's an actual human being in there that, that gives a shit. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't have to agree with his politics, you know, I mean, is there any politician that a person agrees with them on everything? If, if there is, I don't know who it is. Uh, and if a person is agreeing with somebody on everything, then, um, I, I think the person is misled, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a, it was a closed, uh, closed door ceremony and it wasn't meant to be, um, you know, something they got out into the public. Uh, there were some, I think, White House photographers there. Right. That uh, snapped some pictures, I think, for, you know, posterity's sake, I don't know. Um, but that was never the plan for that to get out. Um, and when it originally did get out, I, I'm, I'm still not sure how that ever uh, got onto social media. But once it did... Uh, <laughs> I kind of realized, well, uh, everything has changed now. Mm. Um, because the way I had been living my life up into that point was almost completely under under the waterline. Mm -hmm. And I like uh, how you use a former, like a, a recon analogy, under the waterline. Yeah, well, we're amphibious, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway. What does um, it mean for you? What, what, what does it mean to be an American? To be an American? Yeah. I was thinking about this. Um, individual liberty. I think individual liberty, that's, I still feel like that's the cornerstone. Um, I think I always have. Um, it saddens me over the past 10, you know, 15 years to have watched, uh, a majority or not a majority, but a, a, a large share of um, the American populace buy into the idea that the don't tread on me flag is some kind of racist thing. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't understand that. I, I do. I, I see, um, I see our enemies. Um, I see people who, who, want to drive a narrative that's not good for America or individual liberty, I see that flag, don't tread on me, as a, as a threat to them um, or something that they feel like they need to dismantle. Um, but um, I, I, I think the don't tread on me flag, it, it sums it all up for me, you know? I, you know. It's like, hey, think whatever you want to. <laughs> think whatever you want to about whatever. I don't give a fuck. And I, you know, you, you hear a lot of guys say this, like, I don't give a fuck what you do in your bedroom. I don't care. Um, but don't come 
telling me how to be in my bedroom. Right. Don't come anywhere uh, on my property telling me how to live. Um, and so there's this agreement that that's what that flag means to me. You know, the don't tread on me flag with the snake. It, that's yeah. what it means to me. It's an agreement between opposing opinions. Like you live your life. I'll live mine. It's fucking beautiful. Like we, we stay out of our, each other's way. Um, but it seems like nobody wants to do that anymore. You know, you, you get an opinion, you feel strong about it. Well, Hey man, if I feel like this, then you have to feel like this. And I'm going to fucking force you to feel like this. Like, well, um, for some of us, no, you're not. You're not going to do that. Um, uh, you know, that doesn't fully encapsulate. And I don't think I, I, I could ever um, explain all, all in one sit down, I think, what it means to be an American. Because it's, a, <laughs> I don't know, I, it's um, it's something so ingrained um, in into my every fiber that uh, uh, it's, it'd be kind of like asking like, what does it mean to be you? Evan? Right. <laughs> you know, like, well, shit, you know, what one would think mean? that that would be an easy question. Right. Um, but I, I would challenge a lot of people out there to go and look at themselves in the mirror and just ask themselves in the mirror, who are you? Like, like, and, and and have like a legitimate back and forth with yourself in the mirror. I don't, I think a lot of people would have a, a hard time with that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people are living their life based off of what other people think and how other people think that they should live their life. Um, but, you know, um, what does it mean to, to be an American? Um, Individual liberty, which means individual responsibility. Um, and you're not entitled to anything other than the natural rights and the rights that are given to us in our constitution. And you have to earn it. It's not, it's not free. Well, you have to work for it. Uh, I also think, you know, it's like the erosion of the family unit it seems like it all comes back to that, the attack on the family unit. Um, it, it's, it's led us, I think, to this place that we're at, you know, um, where you're demonized if, if uh, I don't want to say you're demonized because, again, I, I probably um, make it out to sound a lot worse than it is for the majority of Americans. Um, but it does seem like there is a minority of Americans that is is growing, and it seems like um, if something isn't done about it, that minority will soon become the majority, and that minority uh, being people that that don't have any um, uh, that, that don't feel like having a family or being a family man is important, right? Um, I think everything stems, you know, from that, you know, it, like being an American means you, you got to be a, you have to be a father. You, you have to take responsibility. If you lay down with a woman, you marry a woman and you have a child with a woman, then that's your fucking responsibility. You can never walk away from that. And, you know, I, I'm, I know there are statistics that show <laughs> what happens to children as they age, children that don't have fathers. I, I don't think that's a secret anymore. Um, you know, and, and so, God, man, what does it mean to be an American? It, it's, there's so, there's so, so many things. Um, it, if we want it, then, and we want to keep it, then we have to keep earning it. It's our responsibility. It's our duty. You know, people ask me sometimes, they're like, they're like, um, you know, like youngsters, they, they kept at you, uh, especially during the COVID years. Like, I want to serve. I want to serve. I want to serve. But I'm not sure. I'm like, hey, you don't have to join the military to serve your country. H how about this, man? Like, just how about this? You want to serve your nation? Start off with being a good fucking man. Right. Just be a good person. 
be a, be a good person, be a good person to your neighbor. You know, um, just start with that. That's how is that? That's that's serving your country. You know, say please and thank you. Have manners. Be a decent human fucking being. You know, I don't know. I think we were talking about this earlier. You know, I, I hear people sometimes like, no, you know, you're saying things are like way worse now. Like they were just as bad when we were kids. And I'm like, no, I, you know, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think, I don't think they are. I, I think, I think things are worse now, but their argument is like, um, things are, Things were just as bad back then. We just didn't have social media. We didn't, we we weren't able to see it, but it was happening. Like, I don't think so. Um, I remember. I I, I remember um, the seventies. Yeah. I remember the eighties. I remember the nineties. You know. I remember the early two thousands. Shit has gotten exponentially worse in terms of a lot of the things we've talking about in the past ten years. Um. Anyways, I know I, I probably went down a. Uh, That's um, good. Sorry about that, dude. I think it's a. Like I think when you look at duty, because these are these are like very specific and they're they're philosophical things that we we like. What is good? What is evil? What is right? What is wrong? These are these are like somewhat black and white, right? And um, when we look at those things, we say. You know, one we can we we have the touchstone we 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 have the touchstone of of history and the premise of the cornerstone in which the 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 country itself was built on, and so even though people were acting or behaving or making decisions in 1776 that might not match what's culturally acceptable today, there is still the purpose, the direction. Yeah. Of where the country was headed, the meaning of of collective responsibility. Yeah. The meaning of what is it what is freedom. And it didn't have anything to do with, you know, it, it was a principle, a beacon of 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 freedom, the idea yeah. of a country. And I, like some of the things I love thinking about, and like one of the things I love about America, is that you know, you had this melting pot where people were coming to the country. And and if we go back before even the 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 British Empire, right? The, before the British, there were people who were immigrating here that were fleeing uh, royalty and monarchies and oppression, depression. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, oppression, oppression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and. They were pursuing their individual accountability of freedom, yeah. right? their their pursuit of freedom, you know, life, liberty, pursuit, pursuit of happiness. Yeah. And regardless of where you came from in today, like, and I think that's the thing that like kind of binds me into the future and gives me hope is we can still be that. We can still be the beacon of hope, the pursuit of individual liberty and freedom. Yeah. And have this goal of the future, which is we don't have to linger on the, and part of this is like you're trying to judge people that were making decisions in you know, the late 1700s, early 1800s, and you're putting your, your accountability of what we know today on yeah. them and what they were doing in the late 1800s. Right. And then you're judging based on, you know these big based on today's culture. Based on today's culture, they well, missed the mark. It, 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 that's it. That's just yeah. wrong. Yeah, like it it's just wrong. Like that, that. You know, I could go back, and you could go back, and we could all go back. We go all the way back. We say, well, the Roman Empire was wrong, right? The, the 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 Greeks and the Athenians were wrong. The okay, how far do we want to go back? Do we want to go back to Homo sapien, Homo habilis? Do we want to talk about the right. genetic strains and how yeah. people? We're clubbing like like as long as humans have been walking upright, and I would argue probably before, they have been clubbing each other to death, conflict, and enslaving each other. Yeah, it's part of human history. But if there's not something that we're aspiring to in the future, where it's like we're judged on the merits of the individual, yeah, that's what we're all for me. I'm like, hey, we're 
we're all kind of moving in the same direction, which is, I, I'm sorry, but everybody doesn't get a participation trophy, man. No. Like it's not the way life is. You I think that's what led us. Around. That's what led us to this shit. You, know, you remember? It? You remember in like the late '90s when that first? I, I think it was the late. You didn't 90s, want to make so people like, feel bad. Like all oh, the kids are getting a, yeah, a participation trophy. trophy. Like I, I, you know, I, I agree 100. percent And most people, when they when they try and when they try and um, or downplay or, or you know talk ill of of the founders. I think the they're usually missing the mark. Um, they're missing the point, mm -hmm. you know. The point being, like, the, they were striving for something that I think all human beings um, naturally strive to, towards, and and that's like this yearning to be free of oppression. Because I don't think anyone likes being or living. Um, in oppression you know an oppressive society um you know so like going back to what does it mean to be an american i i think that's that's part of it as well like um you know at, at the end of the day is it ever going to be complete and total freedom no it it won't but man when when you talk about something that we should always be striving towards yeah yeah we should always be striving towards complete and total freedom like that should be the end state the goal we won't ever reach it because that's not in human nature we're always going to have conflict where there's always going to be war and i love i do man i i i really admire um the folks out there that uh that believe that world peace is, uh, is achievable I, because I love them because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a noble, it's a noble hope. Correct. But it's, it's, it's an impossibility, right? That's never going to happen. Um, because nature doesn't work like that. There's, there's conflict in everything in nature, you know, and this, these are just my opinions or my, my beliefs, uh, but, but, but you see it everywhere in nature. It plays out everywhere. There is out. no positive without a negative. There, there isn't, man. There's no, uh, there's no dark without light. It, it, it is everywhere. It's everywhere we look for every action. There's a, a reaction that, that, you know, you, you can't have a, you can't have a world without, you can't have a universe. You can't have anything without, um, it's uh, physics. And I, it's, right. it's physics. It's exactly. It's exactly that. <laughs> it's, it's like saying, you know, if we, you know, if, if we, if we could only switch lions in the, in the Sahara to, or, or in sub-Saharan Africa to be vegan, like we would eliminate the violence <laughs> yeah, right. of the, in the animal kingdom. Yeah. Okay, guys. Yeah. Like it, it there's there's like a reality of possibilities and to be fair I, I feel the same way about people that are like hey world peace like that is something that we absolutely should be striving for yeah but yeah there was there's a super famous quote right which is walk softly and carry a big stick i think that was teddy right yeah yeah it was teddy yeah and unfortunately we haven't as as what I would say, it, the, the human race hasn't been able to tip over into what I would call a uniform and international utopian society where everybody is equal and free. That's not that's not where we are as as a world. I think it's like something that like you know I I think Afghanistan for 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 Oof. me it it was like for for you obviously you have your experiences for me the thing that hit me harder than anything even iraq was we I, you know I, iraq was a totally different experience a, you know different country different culture but when you go to I, afghanistan you see that culturally and the difference between major difference where what i would say you know where where some of us in the world are yeah and then 
there is another section of the world, which you can call developing, you could call whatever you want to call, but there's such a drastic difference. And sometimes it's thousands of years, it yes. seems like. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with whether or not like you're Afghani or we're American. It's the, the fact that we hit the fucking lottery. Yeah. Like however the stars aligned, you and I hit the lottery when we were born in America. Yeah. Like some might argue, depending on the scenario, but we were, fuck, we hit the lottery. Because if you're a girl born in a tribal region on the border of Pakistan, you're fucked. Right? You're fucked. You're fucked. You, yeah. You, you, and yeah, and but not, who, who back here amongst the, the, radical fuck i don't even know what you call the, the <laughs> feminist things now like that are fuck it like they never talk about that they they never talk about you know what they do to women in the places that we've been you and i have seen that and 100%. man i i will I'll go out on a limb here and say you know there was a, a a long period of time before i got wounded where there were times where i fucking seriously questioned what in the fuck are we doing and you know i think sometimes i i, I would try and justify you know and it it helped um but when when you see how how they were treating women over there um it almost it almost made it the rest of all your questioning go away because 100%. you realize what what you're doing, like the people that we are fucking killing, what they do to women, what they do to children. Like, hey man, I I sleep like a fucking baby. I sleep like a baby. And it's none of the, you know, the Afghanistan. I, it takes all the strategic and tactical conversation around whether we should or shouldn't, it fucking takes it away. Because yeah. we're like, we're on the right side of the yeah. equation. Yeah. We balanced it out. Yes. And that's a that's something that's very difficult for anyone who's never been there uh, or anywhere. They've only lived in the American bubble of goodness. They they are going to have a, a very hard time um, understanding that. You know, maybe they can academically to a certain degree, but until you see it, until you witnessed, until you watch it happening, like it's not it's not going to sink in. I don't I don't think you know not the way it does when when you watch it when when you're immersed in in those kinds of environments um well i think that's where like for my kids and i think i i think how grateful i am for one having the opportunity to raise my kids in america you know and two i have two girls right and it's never not a thought where yeah. i think if they only knew yeah. Like if they only knew how lucky they are, because my kids, I can talk to them about like, what do you want to do with your future? Where do you want to go? What do you want to be? Do you want to be, you know, a, a doctor or a physicist or a fucking motorcycle mechanic? I don't care. You can still do it. You can still do it yeah. here. And it's so fucking incredible and beautiful. And the fact that that's like, that's the conversation we have yeah. to have with our kids not like whether or not they want to be a girl or a boy. I want to talk to them about whether or not they want to be a firefighter or a, or an a physicist or an astronaut. Or whatever. That's yeah. what I want yeah. the identity to yeah. be. It's not like whether or not they're questioning as to whether or not they should be wearing dresses or suits. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Like you should be giving them the possibility of hope and a future and yes. attaining their goals and aspirations and intellectually stimulating them and making them as positive of an influence in their community 100 you can yeah and it's like yeah. it's a distraction to have this other conversation come in and infect their minds with something different yeah. other than you want to be a physicist or an astronaut Do you want to be a motorcycle mechanic or a fucking police officer i don't care but here's the thing that you will be You'll be a good person. person. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, man, that's, that's, it's, it's one of our highest responsibilities in life. Um, I'm, I'm convinced of that is teaching your children right from wrong. Yeah. It, it, it sounds such like a, such a simple thing, right? Like, 
Um, and it, it really, it is, but that requires you to be present. It requires you to be present. Um, and you know, you say, you said, yeah, we're lucky we're, we are, and we still are right now. And we have been for hundreds of years. We're lucky to, we won the lotto. We live here in America and we still have the opportunity, um, to, to dream big and do whatever the hell you want. But we, we have to, we have to do our part to keep it that way. Yeah. We, we have to, if, if we don't, then it, it, the future generation will not, they will no longer be saying like, yeah, we won the lotto. They, they'll be saying the opposite. Like how fucked up is it that we were born here? Like, I don't think that's going to happen. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't, like, again, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. I, yeah. But I feel like in my lifetime at 51 years old, I don't feel like I've ever seen America this well, you, vulnerable. You, you see it because I see it in, and we can, we can just play it out in data. More teen and 20 somethings right now are looking into the future without hope in a possibility than they ever have before. There's more, or we're calling people opting out of their decisions in their own life, meaning they're just basically staying at home. They're yeah. not, they're not, they're not taking on, you know, college education. They're not joining the military. They're not getting jobs. They're just staying at home. There's a lack of hope in what I would say the younger generation. And, and I will directly burden the previous uh, the people that 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 ran this country before us they're a gaggle of fucking morons yeah and they have fucked this up so badly five ways from friday man yeah dude yeah. like when you think about it it's like 35 trillion dollars yeah like it's, when you saddle I, it's hard to comprehend that figure it, it, here we are and, and and so how are you like when you're looking at you know interest rates and you know tax burden and then you know, we're looking at the AI, you know, intersection of, you know, machines taking AI. on human jobs and all these other things that we're looking at. We're like, okay, but for the last 20 years, you, you know, the, the big R, we'll call, I, I'll say it's the big R and the big D, yeah. put us into a multi-decade pursuit of occupation and war that was the largest transference of wealth from the American taxpayer to the Ameri American military industrial complex. Yeah. It is the largest transfer of wealth in American history, in American history. And now our kids are going to have to pay that debt. Yeah. And by the way, while China was gobbling up ports and economic influence and doing all these other things. And, by, and so that's why I'm like, the jerseys need to be out of the fucking out, out, out of this conversation altogether anymore. There is no red, there is no blue. There is only you. Yeah. Like and that's the bottom line. It's red, white, and blue. Wouldn't it, it wouldn't be nice. Wouldn't it be nice. <coughs> wouldn't it be nice if if both of those parties just went the fuck away and and there was there was only one it's it's not like there's it's not like there's two parties now. It's a fucking uniparty. It's a uniparty, right? And I'm not advocating for for getting rid of that and and and, and it's void bringing in another uniparty. But my God, wouldn't it be nice if if we had a party that was to rise up and you know maybe call it the American Party? I like I'm a fucking American, and I'm only here to fuck shit up and do what's right, right. for this fucking country. That's it. That's that's it. I don't mean fuck shit up for us, but fuck shit up for anybody who means us harm. You know, like I don't know. I I think I I started I started going down and think thinking a lot about these things. Um, you know, when H. Kaya happened, mm -hmm. it, like it's funny, man, because. How many people over the past five years since I, I was wounded um, have looked at me and and made, a, you know, a judgment of me? Well, like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's definitely 
he's walking PTSD. You got to be careful. I mean, I had doctors that were putting PTSD in my medical records without me knowing, you know, like, hey, take that shit off. I'm, <laughs> I, I, I do not suffer currently from post-traumatic stress. Um, and I'm not saying that like, yeah, that's some kind of, I'm some kind of a superhero because I, I don't suffer from PTSD, right? Um, but I, I will say this, man, I, I never felt like I suffered from PTSD. I mean, I did after my first deployment, you know, coming back from Iraq the first time, um, I think it's inevitable. The first time you, you see war, you see dead bodies, you, you have to kill. I, I don't think you can escape that unless, unless you're a sociopath, you know, or a straight up psycho, you know, it, if you are, then you, you probably will be free of PTSD. Um, you know, I, I remember specifically coming home and feeling really fucking awkward for, for a couple of weeks, you know, pr probably for a couple of months driving down the road, feeling like on edge. Yeah. But every single time I would deploy and come home, it was like a little bit less, a mm -hmm. little bit less, a little bit less. And to the point where eventually I would come home and, and it was like, yeah, it's, it's just life. That's life. It's, this is life. Like I recognize it for what it is. People are going to die, right? People are going to live. People are going to die. That's just life. And there's no sense in me bending myself all out of shape over it. But I will say this, man. When, when we withdrew from Afghanistan in the fashion that we did, and we lost, um, you know, our Marines that day at Abigate at Hkaya. I, honestly, man, I, I think I watched that from my living room, and um, man, I, I, I still, I, uh, I think. It's difficult for me not to feel emotional about that. Um, and, but when I ask myself, I'm like, why? I mean, you, you've seen plenty of uh, American servicemen and women die over the years, you know? Um, you've watched it, like you've seen it happen right in front of you. Like, wh why is this different? Well, I don't know, man. I'm, but it, it was, it was for me and and I know I'm not the only one. I know that there's a lot of us, you know, that weren't there that watched that shit happen and watched that withdrawal. And I don't even, I, can, I still can't come to grips with it being a withdrawal. I felt like that was a fucking retreat. Not at the individual level. Those Marines were not fucking retreating. We, that's not, that's not in our nature to do that. But from the big picture, from government standpoint, it, it felt to me like a fucking retreat. And um, the fashion and, and, and the way that, that that happened, I don't, I think it is, is um, one of the lowest moments of my life and it, and it still is. And I, I hope um, that people never forget that. And it's not me saying that like, oh, we should have stayed in Afghanistan forever. Like, and that's the last thing. That's the last thing I wanted. Um, you know, and my my opinion on Afghanistan is that, hey, we killed we killed Bin Laden. All right, it's time to fucking leave, right? Like, we we came, we accomplished our mission. Let's fucking go home. Mm -hmm. You know, and I have a lot of friends. A lot of very, very dear friends that will argue with me on that. Like, hey, man, you know, we have to be here. We have to be there. It's just keeping us safe abroad. We find them here. We want to find them there. I get it. I understand. Um, I understand that point of view. But that's that's not necessarily my point of view. People might be like, well, Clint, you were there. You were fucking there way after Bin Laden. I'm like, yeah, it's my fucking job. I was a professional fucking warfighter. You know, so it's fucking messy it's messy it's it's difficult and watching it all culminate there at abbey gate like it 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 took a, a very um profound negative uh, effect on me 
And I, you know, I know I'm not the only one, you know, I know I'm not the only one, you know, um, we, we needed to do that better. And, and the sad part of it is, is we could have, could have, we could have, it's just not like that was a unique situation that's never played out in American history before. Look, right. fucking Vietnam, Saigon. Like, it really wasn't that long ago. No. Um, it was in 1973. Yeah. I mean, we, the playbook, the playbook on what not to do was there. It's there. It's still there. <laughs> it's still there. And, and direct responsibility and accountability to what I would say is the, the elderly representatives yeah. that not only were alive, some of those guys to include the the current president was, I think you might even have been still in Congress at that point or just elected. So it's like not only had it happened in 1973, but it was also within what I would say is the representative professional lifespan of some of the people that were, 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 were representing the American so-called quote unquote, so-called representing. Yeah. And the, such a failure to the American service members mm -hmm. and the sacrifices that, that, you know, we collectively made, which that is a failure that nobody on Capitol Hill took accountability for. And that to me is one of the, the, the biggest sins, which is when people fail to take accountability for their failures. And there's still zero. Zero. Zero accountability. Zero. Zero. And if that the, doesn't the forced reckoning can happen every two to four years. Like, and that's yeah. what I think what you keep coming back to and why I keep coming back to, which is the forced accountability can happen in this country every two to four years. Yeah. When every time there's an opportunity to vote these fucking idiots out of office, we got to take it. We have we to. Gotta. We have to. I, it, it, it kills me when, when I hear, when I hear people say, I ain't fucking voting. I ain't voting. I ain't voting. Uh, and I, I try to think, you know, put myself in their shoes, you know, and I understand, I, I, I understand where, where they're coming from. Because they're looking and they're like, it's all fucking corrupt. Why, why the fuck would I vote for anybody that's corrupt? And, but man, um, we cannot give up on our system. We just need to systematically re-engineer it back to what it was meant to be to begin with. Because it has become absolutely fucking perverted. It is a distorted and perverted version of what it was meant to be. Um, and, you know, I, I think, I think the, you know, all these, all these years in 20 plus years of, of us fighting, it's not just our GWAT war, you know, wars, right? It wasn't just one, it's like multiple. But, you know, Vietnam, Korea, we, we look back and if you cannot see the military industrial complex bleeding us, utilizing our blood to line their pockets, then you're not looking. You're not looking, you know. Um, it, the, probably the most accurate statement I've ever, ever read is war is a racket. It is a racket. And, um, and uh, you know, that's not, that's not me saying that, um, uh, that's me describing the wars that we've been involved with my entire life. It seems like a major fucking racket. And I, I think the only time in my life where war all out fucking war was justified, like there was a, a damn good reason to go and fucking get it on was right after 9-11. Right after 9 11. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was executed well. It was with efficiency, the right guys. Yeah. The, it could have been over with like that. I think, like I, that. I, I think it was like 120 days 
like you know, a handful of guys, Northern Alliance. Yes. We, we walked through that country with overwhelming fire superiority and air cover. We had the international community behind us, uh, where we where where we collectively where we made the mistake from my perspective was when we started a large scale war of occupation and nation building. Oh, that makes money though. Yeah, it I makes know. a lot that's, of money. That's where the money is. Yeah. And <clears throat> you and I are old enough now. We can talk about this and we can say, hey, I'm proud of my service. I love this country. But I don't have to agree with everything we've done. No. I've actually earned the right to disagree and be very open with my opinion. Damn right. So have you. Yeah. And it's fine. I can balance those two things. And I balance them completely and coherently every day. It's like, from, from my perspective, like when we, when, we, when we look back, and we look at all the different things like, man, I can be really fucking proud and, and be not only proud, but excited about some of the shit that I did because it was really fucking interesting. It was the right thing to do. And sometimes it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And like, as, as we start to look, look back, like, but I, I don't repaint history and say that it was like, it, it, it was a earned evolution emotional and intellectual evolution of an individual and being able to pressure test and put forth your ideas and ultimately earn the evolution. Like I earned it. Yeah. And I paid the price of whether I agreed or didn't agree, but at the end of the day paid the price to say, you know what? I can disagree with the premise of the invasion of Iraq. I can say that. Yeah. And I know I have a very specific argument directly related to that, but I can also say the first part of that, I was fucking chips in. Like, let's go regime change. Let's get yeah. that guy out of power. Let's go. And I'll tell you the day where it clicked in my head where I was like, fuck, was the day Saddam sat a, a, when he was right before he was being hung. He said, and I and I'm going to paraphrase, but he was like, "I'm the president of Iraq, basically, fuck you." Yeah, and I was like, "That was probably the right guy to run this country," because <laughs> even up to the second he was like swinging from a rope, yeah, his ego was like, "I I I am the guy," and yeah. I'm like, "That's kind of what that country took." I'm not validating or nor am I saying he was a good person in any way, shape, or form. I'm saying like that country at that point. Oh, man. Like it took a personality. It did. It did. It yeah. took a fucking very specific personality. I have good thoughts on this. Yeah. Um but I think the the time uh for me came just a little bit before that, you know. Um and it it wasn't exactly like you know, light switch went on and like, oh my God, I, whoa, we're, we're fucking it all up. We're, we're doing it wrong. But it was a moment where it didn't, the, what was happening did not make sense to right. me. And, but you know how it is when you're, when you're young and you're, you're, you know, you're in that environment and you're new to, to combat, you're new to war. Like you're busy, you're busy with, your mission, your objectives, the things that you have to concentrate on in order to crush your enemy and to stay alive. But for me, it came around 2004 um, when our ambassador at the time, Ambassador uh, Bremer. Bremer, yeah, when uh, him and his his uh, I don't even know what to call his aide. Um, I I won't call him anything, but I have some choice words that I would call him in private. Um, he had the ear of the ambassador, and I think he had the the good idea of drawing up a, a new constitution or whatever. And, you know, all his chitter chatter to the ambassador at the time is like, we need to fire the existing standing Iraqi army. Right. And meanwhile, where, where were all those men? They were all hiding out in 
you know, uh, they had all I'm the guns. T- they, they were, <laughs> they, they the were guns. standing by, yeah, standing by, waiting for us to to send them word, like, hey, everybody, show up, formation, uh, let's, go. We, let's go, come on. Instead, the word they got is like, you're all fired, debathification, overnight, yep. overnight, and I watched it happen, man, overnight. It, the very next day, the very next day, you know, we have Blackwater guys get uh, strung up on, on the bridge in Fallujah. And I remember taking that uh, CD that was passed to me by an intel uh, lady and saying, you, you need to take this to the chief of staff. Um, and on that CD was the footage of that. And overnight, Route Irish went from, you know, somewhat uh, survivable to like, hey, every time we get on that stretch of road, every time. every, every time. single time, yep. there was another blown up vehicle, um, multiple yeah. Dead Man's Bridge. You go over every overpass, like it was, and you so watched fucking yeah, nasty. You watched their TTPs mm-hmm. evolve with with us you know everything that we did to counter it they would just evolve you know um and for me that's that's when i started realizing like hey man we're we're fucking up here um because before that i was like uh, uh, guilty man guilty hey we're going to iraq fuck yeah let's go kill them like we'll go kill all of them you know young man i was fucking eager to get after it but (laughs) It it didn't really it didn't really start clicking uh, until that. When when until was the happened. first? What was your first combat rotation? Two thousand four. Two thousand four. Yeah. yeah, I missed the ground invasion. So, and I was pretty bitter about that. Were you in the Marine Corps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was stuck in. I want to say stuck in Okinawa, but I was at Third Recon at the time, and um, like what a, what a phenomenal place that was. But but the you know we were all feeling it because. I don't know of a recon marine, young recon marine that like, hey, there's a war going on, like, and you don't want to be there, right? Like, no, every one of us wanted to be there, and so that was a that was kind of a difficult thing, you know, watching the ground invasion from Okinawa. It was so I was chomping at the bit to get over there, and um, in fact, so much that I was I was considering leaving the Marine Corps and like going to mm-hmm. like, you know, triple canopy or yeah. gun corps or something like that. My God, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I didn't do that. Um, but a lot uh, of guys did a lot yeah, of guys, I, did. a lot of guys did a lot of guys. And like, I know I don't, I'm not no, judging, I'm not judging them. Sure. Um, but I, I only look at it from the, from the aspect that it, had I done that, then, you know, um, the course of my life <laughs> would have, well, who knows? Um, but I don't think a whole lot about what it could have, should have. I don't, I don't, I don't think. I, you know, my dad says this, like, you know, your rear view mirror is this big, your front windshield is this That's big. right. Like, just concentrate yeah. on the front windshield, man. Yeah, I think you he back up every now and again. I heard him say that when, uh, when he was down, when he came down. <laughs> <laughs> your hunting about. trip. <laughs> that was so, so bad. But, no, I, I, um, I, I do. I got to go back, though, because, like, you got 2004, you're in the Marine Corps, you go, like, a lot of people don't like they they don't quite understand your history and one of the things i love about your history is like it's fucking wild like you don't necessarily take a lot of what i would say is credit for it in the context of like a, a couple of years ago me and logan we went down to guatemala and <laughs> yeah, yeah. guatemala and we were down in guatemala on a coffee trip and we went out to do a we flew down into this air base and then we went out on a fishing trip and we we're like, Hey, we're down in the, this the Guatemalan, uh, military training facility. Yeah. It's like we flew in there and you were like, yeah, I went to gym school down there when yeah. I was like, what was you 17 years old or something like that? You got to tell this story. Yeah. I was, uh, well, 16 when I, when I went down there, <laughs> um, yeah, it was, uh, a little place called Puerto de San Jose. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I used to, I used to worry about talking about that a lot because I thought that 
Like that's going to keep me from, they won't yeah, take right, me into right. the military. You know, they'd be like, oh, you know, you're you're security risk, you're some kind of spy or something. Like, you don't know, you can't come in. And so for a lot of years in my life, I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I never talked, you know, I didn't talk a lot, a lot about my world travels, you know, um, but yeah, it, you know, Guatemala, um, well, t- how did you get down there? Like, well, I, that, that's, that's important. That's, it's an important yeah. thing. Like you got to lead into this. Story. Well, I had a unique father, yeah. you know, um, my father was, um, you know, a, um, a heavily experienced combat veteran, um, served in Vietnam for multiple tours, I uh, saw so a lot of, uh, a lot of heavy, uh, fighting, you know, a lot of fighting. Um, and you know, I often, I think about my dad as, as like a guy who he learned how to kill, you know, um, uh, before he ever learned how to love anything, you know, because his environment growing up was, uh, you know, I won't call it abject poverty, but you know, it, it was, a, it grew up very, um, uh, without, without a lot. Um, and, um, you know, it w- wasn't treated very well, um, by his father. Um, so when, when his time came, it was like the Marine Corps, there's a war, I'm getting the fuck out of here. And, uh, you know, I don't think he ever really experienced what it was like to be loved or to love anyone. Um, and, you know, I think that has a, that has an effect on a person, you know, you learn how to kill people, you know, and you learn how to do that really good before you've ever felt any kind of love in your life. And I don't mean to get sappy or anything, but like that, that has an effect on a person. Um, but you know, he, he came back from Nam and, um, uh, I don't think he was finished yet. <laughs> um, it was a very different time back then. So, you know, like, where are you going to, where are you going to go and, and fight? You know, because um, in, in the late seventies, uh, the hangover of Nam was in full, full effect. And, uh, you know, a lot of your war fighters, like your true war fighters, you talk about like out of every 100 and then, uh, you know, I don't know the whole saying, but sure. like, then there's one that'll bring them all back, whatever. I think my old man was, was kind of the, that guy. So that kind of put him in a place where, well, where, where do I go and utilize this thing that I'm really good at? Um, and I think that, you know, kind of led him to, to places like Central America because there was a lot of conflict in Central America during that time frame in the eighties. And, um, you know, he was a, he was an interesting person, um, especially as a father, as a parent, the, the way he parented me and my brother, um, was pretty unique. You know, he did not have a filter. Um, he didn't believe in that. He, he, he thought, he thought that that will hamstring my boys, you know, they need to learn how to survive in a, in a world that, that doesn't give a shit. Um, so there's aspects of, of his, his methodology. So he, uh, if you will, that, I, that I've, I've stolen from time to time. Um, but there's a lot of things that, uh, that I've chosen not to as a parent. Um, but you know, when I got to that age, uh, and I was having a lot of issues as a kid, you know, with, excessive amounts of energy um you know i i think you know i started getting to a lot of trouble i was doing like stupid shit you know and i think my old man's really uh, gotten to the point where like i don't know what to do with this kid he doesn't he doesn't respond to me beating the shit out of him he keeps doing it like he's just like won't course correct um I took a lot of beatings, man, like a lot of beatings, but it wasn't until, you know, he took me down to Guatemala. Um, and that, that piercing of the American bubble of goodness was really what would open my aperture and started forcing me to look at the world differently. 
Um, because I, you know, I thought I, you know, when you're a teenager, you think you know everything, which is why you should leave when you're a teenager right. while you still know everything. But um, getting down to Guatemala was, um, and seeing, seeing just how radically different um, cultures and societies can be um, in comparison to our own was a, was an eye opener. And his thought process was, uh, this will toughen him up. This will open his eyes. Um, and you know, he was, he was right about it. His, his way of going about it was a, a bit, uh, <laughs> unorthodox. unorthodox. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, uh, we, we did that. And, uh, I went through jump school down there and, um, and so, you know, my path from that point was um, very pointed in in a in a general direction of uh, a life in of service in in the military, some way, shape, or form. And originally, I wanted to go in the Marine Corps. I, I um, you know, in high school, I went to the Marine Corps recruiters. I told them I wanted to join. I went and took the ASVAB took all the tests and all that shit. I gave him my fake ID. I'm like, I'm old enough. Um, and you know, the, the Marine, the recruiters, they, they would come to my high school and they pick me up and like, I'd be walking out, walking out after school was over. And like the Marines would be there standing outside their, you know, little govy in their dress blues. And man, I would just walk up and be like, all the other kids are looking at me and they see me getting in the car with Marines like oh, on cloud nine, man. And, um, that, that's, that's how it felt. And I was like, my God, man, like this is happening. I'm going to be, I'm going to be one of these guys, you know, and it was all going really good until, <laughs> until those two guys, the, the two recruiters, uh, decided to come to our little, uh, shabby ass apartment. And, um, I was in my room doing homework. Yeah. It was just in a pair of boxers, man. And, I still remember this, ladies, because it was a very instrumental moment in my life. Um, I heard the doorbell ring. So I went over to my door that led out to the rest of the apartment. And I opened my door, and I could see the front door. I cracked the door open. And all I could see was my dad opening the door. And all I caught a glimpse of was about this much of the dress blues. And I was like, oh, shit. Shit. <laughs> I close the door and I'm like, the gig's up. The gig's up, man. Because I hadn't told my dad any of this shit. You know, I hadn't told him any of it. Now, granted, he's a Marine. Like, he yeah. was a Marine. Right. And he was like, uh, what are you boys doing here? Like, it caught him totally yeah. off guard. He's like, y'all come on in. And I, you know, um, and I could hear the conversation going. I had him come in, sit down at our kitchen. Table. Our apartment was like, it was just like one one room uh and then you know i had a room my dad had a room um but they came in they sit down he exchanged some pleasantries for a minute or two and then the inevitable that i knew was coming he's like clint <laughs> and i'm like fuck man what am i gonna say how am i gonna do this like, because you know lying lying wasn't it was not that, that was unacceptable. Um, I, I didn't have a lot of rules right. in, in growing up, right? I had very few rules, but there was that. Like, don't ever lie to me. You lie to me, you will pay. Um, so I'm sitting in there and I'm like, yeah, I lied. And so, you know, I opened up the door, walked out. I think I stood at like parade rest in my boxers and uh, I kind of glanced over at my dad and I could see, you know, I could see his nostrils flaring and like you see the, the anger. And it, it wasn't that I had gone and done that. It was that one, I didn't tell him and two, that I lied to them. And that was a big deal. Um, and it was a, um, yeah. So I, I, I had to stand there because he, he, he was like, you have something you want to say to these two men? And, and I did. I, I said, I'm sorry, but I lied to you. I'm not old enough. And, man, the look, 
the look on their face, they, uh, I'll never forget it. Those two Marines, they looked at me like, like I, like they were disgusted, you know, like just utter disappointment. And, um, that had a huge effect on me. And, you know, I think at that point, my dad had decided, well, like the time for beating you is over. Um, and he took a different direction. He, he's like, I know that you're going to do this. I know that it's inevitable that there's no talking you out of it, but if you're going to do it, then why not try doing it this way? Right. You know, so he, he sold the whole national guard route, you know, split option package and, you can go do Ranger and SF. You can eventually make it to Delta and all those things. And I was like, all that sounds so badass. Like, yeah, of course. Why wouldn't I do that? I got a head start. You know, Desert Storm was happening yeah. at the time. And I was like, I'll get over there. I'll, I'll just get to boot camp. They're going to need everybody. And they'll shit me over. And I, you know, just, you know, looked through everything through rose-colored glasses. And I, I, so he, it worked. He convinced me to do that. And I absolutely hated it. It was the wrong decision for me. Um, ended up getting out the wrong way, um, went through a dark period <laughs> in the, uh, in the nineties. And, uh, I eventually came back full circle and said, Hey, I, uh, I need to do what, what I've always been driven in and felt like is, was necessary for me to do. And that's join the Marine Corps. And I, I think everybody in my life at the time was like, what the fuck <laughs> are you doing? <laughs> What are you doing? Because I, you know, I had a house, I had a boat, I had, I, I was sitting pretty, um, you know, not pretty, but like for my age, my peer group, I was doing pretty well. And I, you know, it was like, I don't want any of that. I don't, it's not, that's not who I am. Um, anyways. Well, that's yeah. a good place to pause. Cause I got to take a piss. Cool. Do you got to piss? No, I'm okay, man. Oh, right. So you, you go to South America Central. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Central America. I mean, I, I guess I, my, uh, my geography. Oh, you, you, know, <laughs> you know what you're talking about. I mean. But yeah, you go down there, like, you've got to tell me, like, you're 16 years old. You're going to jump school in Guatemala with the, like, I mean, the, the paracaidistas. What, what the fuck? Like, was this like in Cessnas? Was this in C 130s? No, like, it was in Erva. An Israeli made aircraft. It looks like a bullet and the you know, the ass end of it. Can, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. It opens it can, up. It can open up. Um I have some pretty cool memories, you know, um being on the tarmac and getting JMPI'd, you know, for the first time, uh, feeling all the nerves. Were you just freaked the fuck out? No, I mean you're like sixteen. No, because right? I was full of piss and vinegar, man. I was right. like, you know, <clears throat> I at that point, you know, just young alpha male in me. Yeah. Um had been blossoming and, and yeah. you know, growing and, and like wanting to sharpen his blade. And, you know, that had been happening ever since, you know, uh, adolescence, you know, right. since puberty. Since which, you had a cougar as a pet. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, which is a different story. <laughs> well, that's different. Yeah. Uh, Samson was, you know, I, w I was still uh, an innocent boy at the time, <laughs> you know. Um, there's like a whole different world it is so radically different than, than today. Um, but, um, yeah, I was full of piss and vinegar. So like, what do you have in a household where you've got a young, a young alpha male blossoming and you've got an old <clears throat> alpha male, right? That's, uh, you know, there's, there's like a, there's a conflict that was continuously happening between me and my father, you know? And it reminds me of that joke where there's like young bull, old bull. <laughs> yeah, <It's> totally, <laughs> it's, it's totally yeah. what it is. Totally what young it was. bull turns the old yes. bull. Like, let's run down there and fuck one of them. Yes, like, like, how no, about we walk down there? Fuck them all. Fuck yeah, them. sage advice and like you know the kind of uh, wisdom that you don't get as a teenager. Um, but I had the the uh, you know it was piss and vinegar. I was you know, full of it, man. And whatever my dad threw at me, it was like bring it on, you know, bring it on. And, um, so I, I was having a lot of fear and a lot of, uh, emotions that I wasn't really, really used to because this was something much different. It wasn't the environment. It was the fact that like, uh, Hey, I'm getting ready to 
fall out of the sky. And yeah, I, no matter what I do, I could die. Everything prior to that was like, yeah, no, I ain't dying. There's no way I'm fucking invincible. Right. You know, and I think most, most young boys, it, you know, at that phase in their life, that's, you know, when you're feeling that feeling of invincibility, I think that's a good thing, yeah. but it's got to be nurtured and it's got to be, you have, you have to have an, an older, you know, role model, right. um, guiding you, you know, it's like the, it's like the, the bumpers they put in the, in the bowling alleys, right. you know, uh, keeping you from, from falling, uh, falling into the gutter. Um, but the, the fears that I started having on the tarmac first time I was getting JMPI, you know, I'm, um, it was all of a sudden very real. And I started having these feelings like, uh, my dad doesn't really, he doesn't really give a shit if I live or die. I'm, what the hell is going on here, man? Like he's all of a sudden it's like, um, and you know, there was another funny aspect of it. Um, as the, as the plane was, was pulling up for us to get on it, um, this kid, this kid, he's like 12, he comes over and, you know, at that point in my life, I, I had reached, yeah, you know, maybe I was a, an inch shy of what I was, what I am. Well, I can't say what I am now, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, what I ended up being, you know, um, and, you know, he was, he was like down here, like an obviously a child. Right. And fully kitted up. And I looked at him and um, turns out he was the colonel of the base. It was his son. And. It was his first time jumping too. He's like twelve, right? He was twelve. Yeah, twelve years old. <laughs> and um, so in our stick, they they put us, they put us in, and I was the last person out of my stick to go out of the aircraft. That kid was right before me, and when he got to the door, he fucking froze. He froze, and then he just sat down. <laughs> he sat he, down? He sat down right there, and he's like, you know, I don't know what was what he was saying, but <laughs> it was 12. like shaking his head yeah. and like freaking out. And, you know, I'm watching this, and I'm like, okay, this isn't good. This isn't good. And <laughs> the jump master just like literally picks him, picks him up and <laughs> just throws him out, and like he disappears. And, I'm, and then the jump master looks at me. I'm like, it's okay. It's all right. Like, <laughs> out I go, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I uh, you know, those first few minutes, I mean, shit, you just did it the other day. Yeah. Um, those, those first few seconds that, that you come out and your chute opens and all of a sudden this, that beautiful feeling, that breeze and the quiet, um, the quiet that follows right after that turbulent, like the tornado. chaos, the tornado <laughs> yeah. that you've just come out of. Yeah. And all of a sudden, pop, peace. And it's like, oh, my God. And you're looking, the bird's eye view, and you see the earth below you. And you're like, I'm not going to die. I th this is fucking awesome. And like, hook, line, and sinker, man. I was like, this is it. This is, this is what I'm going to do. Eventually, I'm, I'm going to be doing this. You know, I didn't know how it was all going to work, right. but like, I... I I knew that that was going to be, that was going to be my path, um, eventually. Somehow, How many years later way. did you go to jump school? Like actual U S jump school. So, um, I went, I went to, after my junior year of high school, yeah. I went to Fort Benning and I went to boot camp, and then I finished boot camp, um, <laughs> down there at Sand Hill. And then as soon as I finished boot camp, I came back. Uh, cause it was during the you summer split option. Right? Yep. Yeah. Split option. I came back and I finished out my senior year, which was a, I, it was a whole different, like I was a, I was a prick my yeah. senior year, man. And like me and my high school buddies are listening, man. Like, I'm sorry I was a prick, but like I had a different mindset yeah. and I felt like I did not need to be in high school anymore. Um, so after my senior year of high school, I went back to Benning and I went through AIT, which mm -hmm. I think that I don't know if they still call it that, but advanced infantry training. Yeah, I uh, think they you, still call it that. Yeah, you pick up your MOS. Yeah. I was an 11 bullet, you know, um, 11 Bravo. And um, I say 11 bullet, 11 bullet stoppers, yeah, yeah, what we used to call yeah. them. But um, as soon as AIT was over, um, uh, 
my drill sergeant, he was like, hey, you're, you're going to airborne school. And I was like, I know. That's, that's where I made Well, so am I. So you're coming with me. So he drove me. Seriously? Yeah. We drove from Sand Hill right yeah. over to uh, airborne school. Checked in, and I was like, fuck, yeah, man, I'm here, and this is happening. I'm doing it. <clears throat> and and I knew, because I was told, that as soon as airborne school is over, like, I'm, You're going, I'm going to, ranger to ranger school. school. You're going to ranger I'm school. going to ranger school, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> And uh, airborne school did not turn out to be, like, what I thought. Even, even back then, even back then, oh. it was way easier, way easier way. than I had, had imagined. You know, because I was – I was looking at it through the scope of like World War II, you know, 101st, like old school, how how tough it was back then. And what I witnessed when I was going through airborne school is like, this is fucking easy. This is easy, man. Yeah. There's nothing hard about this. Like the, the runs are slow as shit. Um, like you're wearing shoes and PTs. Yeah, you're and not wearing boots anymore. Like they used to wear boots and fatigue and shit. Like, yeah, yeah. Now you're wearing like running shoes. And you're doing like a 10 exactly. minute mile. You're exactly. Like, yeah. You do a 10 minute mile. That wasn't. Like for guys like Clint and I in the nineties, like a ten minute mile was like the the ruck almost like a ruck pace. It wasn't yeah. a run pace. Run yeah. runs were like six and below. Yeah. Like they weren't yeah. <laughs> like yeah. a and ten minute mile is like mean, a <laughs> that's not something you do. Dude, it was like painfully yeah. slow. And it's like horrible. The, back yeah. then, like I could run circles around mm-hmm. fucking most most every you know, most everybody that I was around at the time in those schools, you know, in boot camp and everything. Like PT was easy, man. Just simple. Um, but, you know, graduated airborne school and, you know, they, 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 they put me in front of the board to be like the honor grad for airborne school, which totally made sense to me because it's fucking easy. And I knocked everything out of the park, man. Like they were like, uh, that, like I didn't feel like it was nothing that I had any issue with in airborne school. So I got tapped to sit in the board to be what did they call it? I don't remember. It wasn't Iron Mike, was it? It was whatever the yeah. uh, the honor whatever grad was. And I sat, I sat in that board, and I lost to a Marine. I lost to a Marine because my uniform was so fucking nasty, <laughs> it was so ate up. Like, I didn't know how to like I didn't know how to dress myself. Like, and like that was that was the first time in airborne school where I realized like. And did I join the wrong service? Because, dude, the Marines, the Marines at Airborne School were so fucking locked on and squared away. Um, yeah, I remember because yeah. the going through, and this is the first time I ever saw this. I didn't quite understand because you couldn't wear Marines couldn't wear any badges on the outside of their uniforms. Right. And Just they the were EGA. on the unside. They were on the underside. Yeah. So. Once they graduated, you could flip that. I think it was their 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 pocket yeah. up. Yeah, your breast pocket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I was like, yeah. oh, like that's cool. I 100% remember thinking, that's great. You know why? Because these, like, these badge chasers. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's like, it's like the tab chasers or the bad chasers in the army. Like, and it's like, it reminded me of like a Boy Scout uniform where yeah. they have all these like. Yeah. Patches like I'm a good fire starter. Right. I'm a good, you know, uh, a, right. a recycler or wh- whatever. Yeah. I'm like that's kind of dumb. And juvenile. I also liked it too because you know, you know, I remember all the uh, beat your boots and all that stuff. Or yeah. you know, you drop and you had to drop and, and do push ups or whatever. Whenever a marine would have to drop, every fuck every, every marine in formation would drop. Yeah. And I saw that and I was like, these guys are different, man. There, there's something different and i'm like you know i'm not trying to cast a, a, a shadow or you know any negativity on the army at all man um it just to me it seemed like there was there was a difference there and anyways i graduated uh airborne school and then there i am you know uh in the formation area and the rangers are coming and and i went over and they didn't call my name and i think that was when i realized like I have been lied to. <laughs> like, they lied to me, man. Like, this is I'm. They're not. I'm not going through rip, and, which I thought that's where I was going because that's what they told me when I signed you mean the contract. Really lied to you? That's yeah, weird. yeah. It was like, <laughs> how is that possible? It's so strange. But I, that 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 caused some bitterness, you know. Um, and then on top of that, you know, when I checked into my unit, 
um, again, I'm not I'm not trying to like um, talk down about the the folks that were in that unit. You know, fucking awesome dudes. Um, but it just wasn't it wasn't what I had in mind. Right. You know, I I did not want to be doing uh, that stuff part time. I wanted to be doing it all the time. Right. Um, and it, at the time, it, it turns out it wasn't so easy to just come off of reserve status and transfer over to active. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, I I, uh, I eventually got to the point where I left the National Guard in not a very good way. And, and you know, that, that gave me bad paperwork. And I had an, a reenlistment code that, that said, hey, you're you're not coming back in. I think it was RE3 at the time. Right. Um, and so that, that became a dark cloud and how many years of separation did you have from around 95, from 95 to 99? Oh, okay. So four years. Yeah. Four years. 99 was when, you know, 96 is when my, my dad died in an uh, airplane crash, um, in South America. And that sent me into a, um, a whirlwind of like, yeah, it, you know, my safety net was gone, you know, because my mom was killed when I was a youngster and now my dad is gone. And like, I always try to tell people that like, hey, be good to your parents because you don't know how long, you, you know, how long they're going to be around. And I can't explain it to you, but once they're gone, there's a feeling that like, hey, you're on your own. Like it's a, it's, I, you know, I don't think you can, you can um, pass on that feeling to somebody. Yeah. It, it's not until it happens to you and you realize like, I have no mother, I have no father, everybody's gone. It's just me. Um, so when that happened, it was, there were some, some dark times from 96 to 99, um, I had regressed and I was, you know, doing, going back to doing stupid shit, you know, um, at the same time trying, uh, to be an entrepreneur, trying to start businesses, trying to do things that I thought I could do and, and be good at, um, was doing construction, working heavy equipment, you know, I worked in strip clubs as a bouncer, just, you know, making tip money, it, just going down a, a like, a path that didn't make sense to me. It was fun. It was fun, but you know, the, uh, the, the, the little bit of maturity I had in me at the time realized like, this isn't sustainable. You can't keep, you can't keep doing this. Right. Um, so I had a, another mentor in my life that was uh, a very good friend, of, uh, with my dad and, um, you know, thank God for him because he, he actively, took measures to keep in touch with me after my dad died and, you know, helped mentor me and help me make decisions. And, um, you know, I, my, my decision to join the, the Marine Corps, um, w- was heavily influenced by, by him a- at the time. He was like, you can't, you're, you're almost 26 years old. You, <laughs> you have to do it now. You know, you can't wait anymore. So, um, yeah, that's, that's about the time where I, I said, um, you know, all this material shit that I've got, none of it matters. It doesn't matter if, if I feel like I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And, you know, I was a new father at the time. And, and so I looked at what I was doing and I'm like, how in the hell, how in the hell is, is my kid going to have any kind of pride in her dad, you know, um, uh, so that that was a um, a big factor too. Like I looked at the Marine Corps as a way of, um, you know, becoming a good a good solid man that that uh, you know somebody that my kids could be proud of. Or my daughter at the time, you know. So when um, you show up to boot camp oh, the Marine Corps. Yes, I loved it, man. I like, loved it. Like, because, I mean, yeah. you, you'd been in the Guard. You, you'd gone through Army basic training, yeah. AIT, and all all that. Yeah. So you show up. Was there any similarities? 
I, I, I don't know because obviously I, um, you, you, you're one of the only guys I, I, I mean, well, obviously I've known if you guys have done both, but I mean, you, you've done both. Yeah. There were, there were some similarities, you know, um, it's funny because when I think, uh, when I compare the two, uh, and this is just comparing, yeah. not, not the services themselves, but the boot camp. Mm -hmm. um, when I compare those two, I look at army boot camp and I'm like, it was a bit more physical than Marine Corps boot camp was. Um, I don't know if that's because of the time difference, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but like people sticks, for example, uh, the army boot camp, like it was still like old school fuel sticks, like these big, heavy ass wooden sticks with barely any foam on the end. And you know, you get the old kicker's helmet and that's yeah. about it. That's it. And you go in there and you beat the shit out of each other. That's yeah, great. And you know, I, I remember being like, this is freaking, this is, <laughs> this is hard, man. This hurts. <laughs> Um, you get and then the fuck out. Yeah. And then <laughs> and fast forward into boot camp and in Marine Corps and uh, we, it came time to Pugle Sticks and they, it's like PVC pipe with this massive, big, huge pad and, you know, all these pads and everything. And, and like, you know, you get to start beating the shit out of each other and you're like, you can barely feel it. You barely feel it. And, you know, so I went on the attack. I remember my opponent in the core doing Pugle Sticks, man. I just freaking started demolishing him. And it, like... The second you start demolishing, it's like, okay, pull him away. And it's like, no, man, like, like I'm supposed to be beating the shit out of this guy right now. And you're not letting me. And it didn't feel like that in the army, but it, you know, um, psychologically, psychologically, I don't know that there's much compared. I mean, it's a totally different game. Like in the core, you have to learn how to talk again. You got to learn how to pee again. You got to learn how to do all of it again. Like, um, because what they're trying to do uh, is erase all of your individuality right. and build you back up, um, and which I th think they still do uh, very effectively. They, there's a recipe there that should not be fucked with very much, you know, it should not be fucked with for just some light and transient causes, you know, like, like it works. Uh, so don't mess with it. Like, yeah, don't fix with it. Don't, don't fix, fix with it's not broken, broken right? Um, so psychologically, it was it was much more difficult, you know, just learning how to talk, um, you know, this recruit that, this recruit this, like, you know, you screw that up and it's like you're paying the price of on the quarter deck, you know. Um, but uh, but no, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And for me, it was exciting because I was doing finally, finally that doing thing. what what I always imagined. That's what I was supposed to be doing. Um you know so where'd you go first so what was your first uh well the whole reason the whole yeah. the, this all started off in a bar <laughs> it all started off in a bar um before i joined the core i was in a bar i was getting shit faced and you know i saw a marine come in in dress blues and he mm -hmm. had a pair of lead sleds on but he was like a pfc or maybe he's a lance corporal i don't remember but i knew enough at the at the time i was like that doesn't look right. How in the hell, how in the hell does a a PFC or a Lance Corporal have jump wings? Like right. that didn't make sense to me. So I went over and I was like, "Hey, man, like, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't think I said like you're stolen ball or anything." But I like I asked him like, "What are you doing with jump wings on there, man?" He's like, "He's like, what did you get busted down?" Like he's like, "No, man." Um, I went to Airmore School. Um, right after I finished uh, school of infantry, you know, and um, I don't know if that's what he said, but I was like, nah, that, that's a like you can't do that. This Marine Marine Corps doesn't do that. Um, he's like, yeah, yeah, I got recon in my contract, and I was like, when the hell? He's like, yeah, a year or something ago, like they they changed it where where you can get a chance to go to recon, um, in your contract. And I think the very next day after I'd sobered up, I was in the Marine recruiter's office. I was like, where do I sign? Like, and I want recon in my contract. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of what, what kicked it off, you know? Um, so after boot camp, I went to SOI. And then, um, you know, after SOI, I went to the basic reconnaissance course in Coronado. Um, Freaking incredible school. Um, 
And then they gave me orders, my first set of orders after graduating uh, BRC. Um, and my orders at the time were like, hey, you're going to Okinawa. You're going to Fifth Force. And I was like, Fifth Force? Like, Force Freecon. Like, I was like, I didn't give a fuck where it was. Like, I didn't exactly want to go to Okinawa. Like, I'd never been over there. And I was like, why can't I go to up the street here in Pendleton, you know? But, you know, they were like, Okinawa, Fifth Force Recon. Like, okay. So I showed up um, to Okinawa. And it was right at the point where they had uh, not dismantled, but they absorbed it all into, like, Third Recon. Right. So you had the Force mission there, um, but that was at, at Bravo Company. And Alpha Company was, you know, traditional recon. Um, and so while I was there at Third Recon, I, I ended up at both Alpha Company and Bravo. So I had gone through shooting packages. I'd gone through recon surveillance packages. Um, and so, yeah, that's that was my uh, that was my beginning in, in the core and, and getting to recon. And, and recon was, uh, you know, I, I look back now and I think what a blessing it was to having gone to Okinawa because in Oki, you know, we were up at Camp Schwab and there ain't much out there. You know, there's a little bitty tiny town out there that uh, they had a, uh, when I first got there, they didn't have it, but uh, there was only one little bar they had, I think Whiskey Dicks or whatever it was called. Um, and then they had a, a little sushi place that we would go to. Other than that, that's all there was. So we, we were like, we were always out training in CTA or NTA, or they would take us out to the Philippines and we'd stay out there. But it was like a constant, constant, like that's where I, I always say, that's where I cut my teeth and sharpened my knife. And I learned my trade. Um, and I think there, you know, it, I don't know if it stayed that way. Um, I, I think things are kind of cyclical and depend on personalities and who's in command, but we had some, seriously talented people um and some excellent leadership um and colonel bristol um was one of my early mentors he still is um and you know so i i uh when i look back and i i think where 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 did i start excelling in life it was it was there um you know it, it was uh Especially, especially once Bristol came, because his his methodology was like, these boys are always going to be out. They're going to be out in the bush. You're going to be out in patrol. You know, it was like constant patrol. And we do like three weeks, three weeks out of a month. He'd bring us back. You got you got a week, you know, week of downtime. You know, work hard, play hard, stay hard. And... um you know, I think in the years after that, uh, there was a lot of people that recognized uh, the, the the kind of people that came out of Third Recon at the time. And it's not me scratching, you know, or uh, uh, I don't know, patting our own selves on the back or anything. But there was a, there was a, a bit of difference in in the caliber, I think, of Marines that were coming out of Oki, because you know. In Oki, like when you're finished up for the day or, or whatever the case is, you you're everybody's going back to the same place. You all live together. Somebody farts, you know exactly who it is. You know, you get so good on patrol that like you truly don't need to communicate verbally anymore. Um, and and I'm so thankful for um, or grateful that that I was able to have that opportunity to learn my trade that well, you know, um, in patrolling. Because you know, I think, you know, the principles of patrolling, they're, they're, they don't change, man. They're, they're, they, they're the same in, in any environment, you know. Um, and so once you learn it one way, you can apply it, you can apply it wherever you are. Um, so that for me, I look at, at Okinawa as like that's where I learned. That's my foundation uh, in war fighting. Um, it all stemmed from there. Um, so, yeah, it, um, it great times, man. Where, where do you think? Of, you know, you're you're 
You went to Oki, your first combat rotations in 2004. Going into that, and then you know you're the the first time you're exposed to to gunfire. Like, yeah, well, it was uh, it was interesting. It was with uh, well, what I think still one of the one of the guys I have uh, more respect for than than just about anyone. Well, I, he'll probably hate me for saying this, but I'll just say crawdad um there's a lot of people a lot of marines a lot of soldiers a lot of a lot of folks who know that name and he was a um um a incredible mentor for me because i i went with him and learned so much from from him um and then you know later on in my career I ended up right back with him and um but uh, I'm sorry. What was your question? Maybe, so uh, the 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 perception. So the your first perception, time, first time going we, in, yeah. and then the reality. The reality. What are the differences? So, I think the first time, my first experience um, was out in Fallujah, and it was right right there next to the Clover Leaf on the outskirts of town, um, on the east side. And this was, uh, I think, April is right after um, ship started going south. And our leadership at the time <laughs> thought it would be a good idea um, to pull back out of Fallujah and in doing so that allowed all the shit to come in, allowed them to reinforce um, and it didn't make any sense. Um, so we were on the outskirts of Fallujah and all of the, uh, you know, the warlords at the time are supposed to be coming out. They're supposed to be coming in and out of big discussion with our leadership and all that stuff. Um, and they're, Crawdad and I are, and um, I remember just hearing orange and white, orange and white, orange and white. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean, orange and white? You know, I'd only been over there for a hot minute, you know. Um, and, and Are you I, talking about taxi? Yeah. You remember the Opals? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, which became like absolutely infamous. Every time yeah. after that, I saw an orange and white. I was like, I'm I'm fucking shooting this thing. Um, but yeah, I remember I remember turning around and like looking for something that's orange and white, and I see this orange and white opal um, had just crashed through uh, a checkpoint on the other side of the cloverleaf, came through the underpass, and what I saw was incredible, man. Like I. I saw like this lone Marine out, out in the middle of the road with this orange and white opal hauling ass towards him and he like firing a couple of shots and he got down on the knee, took a couple of shots. And then right at the last second, he jumps off the road, just misses getting run over. And now I'm watching this, ha this happen. And, you know, at the time I remember thinking like, Oh, well, what the hell? Why, why would this person is, are we doing this? It doesn't make any sense. And then I remember seeing like the muzzle flash, you know, and at this point, maybe he was a couple hundred meters away, you know, two, 300 at the most. And I'm seeing the muzzle flash coming out of, of his window. Um, so the guy's literally driving with an AK, you know, at the crook of his, his window and firing and, you know, all around, all around me. And it, I remember thinking, my God, this this guy's trying to fucking kill me. And then boom, it it all just it all just clicked. But yeah, there was a there was a hesitation there that I think that was the last time there was a hesitation. Um, but it, you know, it was because I was brand new and it, it had not yet, you know, been baptized into it. Um but but yeah, it it, it clicked and when it did, it was like yeah, right on. And um, I thought that it was just me returning fire. Um, and I, that was a strange and uncomfortable feeling because you feel like, fuck, I'm all alone. And uh, I had my very first malfunction on that. Um, and as soon as I 
transitioned, which was very cool. I remember, I remember at the time I was like, fuck, this works. Everything they said, like it all happened. Like it did. And I transitioned to my pistol and, it, and then as I did, I'm like, Whoa, I'm not alone. That's crowd. That's right fucking there. Laying down a steady stream and got my primary back up and, and the orange and white smashes into one of the HESCO barriers, ass into the opal comes lifted off the ground and you know, dude's slumped over. He's dead. And, uh, you know, the car is smoking at this point and, you know, me and Crawdad did it because we couldn't see if there was somebody else, uh, maybe in the passenger seat on the side of the car, that maybe, you know, vehicle hit, came back down, somebody got out, maybe they were hiding in the Hesco. So we went over and cleared that shit real quick. And I remember thinking, oh, oh my God, I'm, I'm breathing, I'm breathing hard. It's like labor breathing. I'm like, why am I breathing so hard? Like, you know, because I barely done anything, you know, physically, it barely done anything. But yet I felt like I was out of breath. And I think a lot about that. Uh, I think. I think it's because there's so much fear going on. Your adrenaline is is just maxed out. Um, but yeah, we we finished doing that. We take, took the threat out, and 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 then uh, we had kind of consolidated away from the vehicle. And the next thing I know, like, like doom, 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 and like there's a fifty cal like lighting the vehicle up, like. And the vehicle like catches on fire and it's like you just in a big ball of flames and we're like what the fuck and you I remember hearing it plain as day man like this this crackled teenage voice from a Humvee you know about a hundred meters away all I heard was that one's mine <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm like, what the hell man um, so yeah that was that was kind of the it was kind of my first uh First real experience, you know, um, uh, and I was I was glad it I was glad it happened, um, but it, it was a bit different. I didn't, you know, you, because before it happens, you always you always second guess yourself, like how am I gonna, like you think you know, right? Yeah, I won't have any issues. I know me. I'm you, I'm gonna react right, but you don't know. You don't know. And it's I was thankful and grateful that that moment had come and I realized like, yeah, I, I hesitated a little bit, but it's okay. I know I, I, I never will again. Um, and I don't think I ever did again, you know, um, but you know, oh, oh, I don't know. Um, it, we weren't, we weren't doing what I imagined we would be doing over there, um, during those years, but but I will or during that deployment. Um, but I will say, like, I think of all the GWAT, of all the years of, of GWAT, um, minus you know the, the very first the, the invasion in Afghanistan, you know, um, two thousand four, like in Iraq, like that was. Uh, I mean, you know, military age male it looks like he has something in his hand. You put him down, put him down, like. Rules of engagement were so, um, I don't want to say relaxed, but they, they, it had not yet evolved to the point where, it, you know, 2008, 2009, where, you know, um, it seemed like... Uh, they evolved. Yeah, they evolved. Yeah. They and evolved. It, honestly, it wasn't until... It wasn't until uh, President Trump came into office that uh, um, you know, I found myself back in Afghanistan and um, the way we were waging war during that period of time, uh, it was the first time that I, I felt like this is how, this is how it's supposed to be done. Um, and it, it, it may upset certain people, but I'm a, of a firm belief that War is the ugliest thing, and to try and fight it at a 50% level with one hand tied behind your back is, uh, is cruel. It's cruel, and it ends up lasting much longer than it should. And so, uh, you know, I say that, like, well, what, how should it be waged? Well, um, it should be waged brutally. 
And I know that may not be a popular opinion, but the more brutal, the quicker it's over and the faster everybody can get back to living mm. their life. Um, and I, I think <clears throat> ultimately the fewer people will die. Um, but that's, that's my opinion. I, I think there's a lot of data that would back that up. I, I would say that that's, that's accurate because when you look at guerrilla warfare, low intensity conflict, however you want to talk about like yeah. that, it's, it's long, it's slow. It's, it can be a painful grind. And I was all, I, I would also say that it, it allows a political process to intercede. Yeah. It also allows attorneys and all these other people to start picking things apart. And yeah. Like, so without like going into a, a whole political diatribe about this, it's like total war. Yeah. And then eliminate threat, rebuild. That's just the way it needs to be. Like from my from my context, I would firmly and one hundred percent agree. Yeah, uh, you leave nothing. Yeah, for interpretation, and at the end of the day, I I one hundred percent agree. It's like we get get our guys back. Yeah, get them home, get them back into the economy, get them plugged into their communities. But when you keep them out there, long year contracted after year, and, like, and what does that do, Evan? What does that do? All that does. By drawing it out and going half measures on everything and, and, and putting, putting the reins on, all that does is ends up creating more and more and more enemies. Oh, that's you know, I mean, how many, how many guys I know that I, you know, that the, the guys that uh, you're fighting later on in the GWAT wars, you know, they were the kids. They were the kids at the beginning. You know, um, I don't know, you know, I, I, I don't say those things lightly. Um, and I know there's, a, there's a ton of people, um, in our society that, that would have a, a major issue with, with, uh, me condoning brutal all out war, um, on anybody. But if we are, if we are going to wage war, then let's, Please, pretty please, let's do it and get it over with. Because I don't know, man. I, I um, having seen having seen it um, conducted in both ways. You know, one with half measures, the other all out. One is more effective, and um, one is more effective it, than the other. I think it's more ethical at the end of the day yeah. as well. I got to yeah. do. I think the long term generational impact is you get it in you, you get it over yeah you move on yeah like and uh, i think that's kind of like where we where we have to like just put a bookmark in that one and, and and leave it i think you know your entire career from the time that you joined to the time that you were separated was how many years oh well, it was I think all in all, when you add in, it yeah. was like 22. 22 years. Yeah, something like that. You know, 22. But that's adding in some, you know, some guard time. Yeah. Have you ever, have you, have you ever thrown a frag in combat? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Tell a, me what you were thinking the first time you. Well, you, I think. The first time you pulled the pin on a frag. Well. For, with, in combat. Not like, like what, what were you, what was going yeah. through your head? Do you remember? I don't. Or was it too chaotic? I don't know if I. Fucking... I remember the feeling, but it's hard for me right now to to remember where where it was. Um, it's in Afghanistan. Um, I think what I was feeling is what I always feel whenever I handle a frag. It was like this thing is. <laughs> it could absolutely kill me if it cooks off early. Like, <laughs> that's that, that's what I was getting. This at. This might be the last time I ever. <laughs> Man, I hope anything. this timing device works. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um. But um, you know, I think you once you get into the groove, and you know, once you're in the middle of a back and forth, 
engagement with the enemy. Um, you know, that, that, that feeling of, of fear of that thing cooking off early, it, it becomes very low on the, on the, your, your, uh, feelings, of, your priority of how you feel, you know, um, because there's usually a sense of urgency. Um, but yeah, a, a frag's, frag's, um, there's always a, something in the back of your mind, you know, whenever you pull a pin, you know, um, the same thing whenever you're dealing with any, any yeah. explosives, you know, and I, I think, um, but that's, that's another thing that I, I, um, I felt like I, I had found a, a niche was, was in, in demolitions and explosives and I ended up, um, wore, wore, uh, multiple hats while I was working at, at, uh, SOTG. Um, and, uh, I absolutely loved, uh, breaching and and that's an interesting thing that i think a lot of people they they don't uh, and i like to try to get get people to talk about these things a feeling of like how much c4 did you do you think that you carried in the course of your career just like or like but the point i'm trying to make is yeah the the first time you you have demo charges in your pocket right so you've got separation of church and state yeah. between the charge and, and the caps your, yeah getting your caps yeah. but yeah like you you first jam that thing in your in your pocket like from what like, like walk me through the way that you felt because i mean there's a comfort level there but then what happens that like there's a transition of just like that that time and repetition yeah, this I think I think that what you just said, time and repetition, it it brings you into uh, uh, I don't want to say your comfort zone um, because that might allude to you know complacency. Um, but I, I've, whenever you're working around anything that you know could very rapidly in a split second, a fraction uh, in your life, you know there has to be a healthy respect for that. <laughs> you yeah. know there it's that's required, you know, and I think as, as an instructor, you, you're looking, you're looking for that out of a student, you know, when you're teaching, um, someone who's never handled, you know, a demo or explosives or anything or doesn't know how to make charges yet. Um, because what you'll often find is, um, you'll find people that, that, do not understand the consequences of being callous um, or not having the respect uh, for what that can do to you. Um, but, you know, time and repetition um, solves most of it. You know, there's always going to be mistakes, you know, uh, shit happens. Um, but we, we try to mitigate that with, with, and I think we do an awesome job. Um, I know we do an awesome job at mitigating those things through time and repetition. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, once, once you have um, a significant amount of breaches under your belt, which you can gain during, you know, going through a breaches course, mm -hmm. you know, by the end of it, like you've got, you've got a very good understanding of how to apply um, the, uh, how to use um, that as a tool to go, I mean, it's just another tool for you to accomplish your mission to, um, to, you know, make entry 100% positive entry, uh, into whatever your objective is, you know? Um, but it wasn't just breaching that, that, uh, that I enjoyed, you know, that that's all fun because it's exciting and things that go boom and are loud. Are, those are fun things. Yeah, I, fun. I, I enjoyed that stuff. But, you know, applied explosives was also a, um, something that I absolutely loved, loved doing um, because you can get very creative. You know, you make different kinds of charges that do different kinds of things. Um, and the more creative you are, um, the more you can uh, apply it in situations where other people might not um, think there's an option, you know. Um, so I think it, it, it starts helping you uh, visualize uh, 
different capabilities that you can bring to bear on a battlefield, you know, um, being creative, you know, I, which takes me down a whole different route when I think about uh, art, you know. Well, it, it, but it's true. It's like I used to call it, you know, the artisan of your craft, right, which is, you know, you start in, as you enter into the profession, you start to gain experience and you become more proficient, you can be more creative yes. because now you have more yeah. individual skills and techniques that you can apply. And now your creativity yeah. starts to, to, to flourish yes. because now you're painting. Like yeah. now you're really fucking. It really painting. is, man. It really is. And I, I think some of the best war fighters I've ever come across are also some of the most creative. Yeah. You know, um, but it's not enough to just be creative and, you know, uh, you, you have to, you, you can be creative all day long. That's not going to make you a great painter, mm. you know. Um, you still have to time have and repetition yeah. uh, in painting and adding your creative, uh, you know, in being creative, uh, that will make you a great painter. Um, but just because you feel like you're a creative person doesn't mean you're going to pick up a paintbrush and, and make a, 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 a freaking yeah. a Van Gogh or a fucking <laughs> a Da Vinci, you know, or um, Monet or whatever. It's... You got to, you got to apply, you have to apply, um, practice and, but and it's the same, right? Like where I start to think about this a lot where, you know, you're talking about like dive school, naval school, you know, principles of patrolling, and then you have the seven dash eight and six dash five, and you've got all these different yeah. things. These are all coming into the confluence of being a profession. Yes. And when your profession is war fighting, it's no different than uh exemplifying your craft over in yeah. you know painting or art or and, and I don't like to just devalue it because it's the complexity of of it yeah is is way bigger than what I'm talking about. But you have to understand that this takes decades to curate. It's it not something you don't learn these things overnight. You, you know. But I will say this, man, and it's along these lines. I you know I I I've thought about this for so many years that, you know, when people are like, you know, something like, oh, Clint, you just high speed shit, man. It's so high speed, you know, special operations and did all these things. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, well, there's really nothing special about any of that stuff, uh, about any of those techniques or the tools that we used or the things that we did, because all of it, all of it is nothing more than applying the, the advanced application of the basics. Mm -hmm. like if, I, I feel sorry for people who have never taken the time in their life to master something, mm -hmm. you know? I think every person should take, the, take a period of their life wherever to, to truly attempt to master something. Will you ever master it? I don't know. But like um, trying to, to master something, try, trying to become the absolute best in your field, whatever that field is, like it's a worthy endeavor, man. And it, it gives you, it, it re, the return on that investment um, ends up lasting you the, the rest of your life, I think. And it it's, doesn't have to be in war fighting. It could be whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, man, I, I um, it, it was certainly a, a very interesting career that, that, you know, spanned, a, a large portion of the war fighting spectrum, I think. Clint, yeah, is our first one, really, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Man. Clint trial, go check them out. Thank you, everybody. Black Rifle Coffee Podcast.